hopefully this will capture it in another file I haven't saved it uh, I think I have to save this and then part one. I will save that. Okay, so battery of problems uh, includes uh, a refresher on concepts. I hope to build uh, actual questions based on those concepts. And while things are getting set up, um, Generally what uh, I have in store is to review the notions of recursive, recursively enumerable. How do you write an argument that some language is recursively enumerable? Um, I will throw in a few new goodies also. I didn't get time to get to them. So I can show very easily that there exists uh, non-recursively enumerable languages. It's a very simple two minute argument. If you pick it up, that's fine. It won't be in the test, but it's good to know that. And I will also give you some material on lambda calculus. I included two questions on lambda calculus. I didn't get again time to teach you that properly, but there is a Joe module for lambda calculus. I, I can run through that. And uh, I'll give you hints on solving the two quiz problems for lambda calculus just because uh, I, I couldn't get enough time spent, uh, but otherwise uh, it's, it's simple, easy knowledge that you can apply to those questions. Okay, so that's what I have in mind. Let this save so that I can at least secure this part of the recording and uh, go on for the next part. Okay, let me also ask you some opinions. So next semester I'm teaching this class. I, the class capacity is 50 to be in a much smaller room. It's a different experience. Um, I like to teach this class. Unfortunately, it has been a, a long time before I taught some other class, so I have permission to do something else to uh, a year from now. So in spring and fall, I'm doing this class, which is fun. Uh, and then the spring after that, I'm teaching something similar to what Pavel mentioned, but this is a entry level grad class, which currently requires algorithms. And I'm trying to broaden it to include uh, applied logics. Uh, the course has not been named as imaginatively as software correctness, but uh, barring that, what I plan to do there is uh, model finders. Model finders are explorers, uh, model explorers are things that uh, check whether the specifications of a system are, are correct or inconsistent. So if you're in software engineering and you want to design a hash table, uh, you write the requirements. Then as soon as you write the requirements, you need a tool to tell you whether there are flaws in your requirements before you begin coding. So there is this cool notation called alloy, A-L-L-O-Y, alloy from MIT, which is a relational logic where you can plug in these and it will tell you where the inconsistencies are. So it's a good way to learn mathematical logic and apply it. A different take on what Pavel teaches. Uh, I will also talk about other specialties. So it's, it's a class that is, uh, Spring 2021, I, I guess you won't be, you would have graduated by then. Uh, but that's uh, one plan I have. Okay, so now I'll start recording this part of the lecture and quickly dive into some fresh material just for fun. Uh, okay. I think I started the screen recording or not. Okay. File. The screen recording is going on, I think. Stop screen recording. Okay, screen recording is going on. There's a stop screen recording. So I'm assuming that the remainder is getting recorded. I saved away the first part. Okay. So let me show you what Lambda Calculus is about. Uh, there's a first Joe tutorial has um, the last chapter is 18, I think. Yeah. So the whole module teaches you lambda calculus enough to understand uh, fixed point theory and how computability was discovered and uh, pri and uh, introduced into the area of computer science by Church. And I wish I could start with this because here the game just goes very briskly uh, in terms of concepts. So let's try. So let, there's a 
historical introduction to lambda calculus. So you can read about that. Let's begin with uh, some actual elements of lambda calculus that builds up programs from almost nothing. So the first thing that you have to build in a reasonable programming language are numbers and then booleans and then conditionals. And then we will come to how to model looping. And there you have the notion of Turing completeness almost attained. So here's how you write lambda functions in Python. I equal to lambda c, c is a lambda expression. And as the name tells you, it's an identity function. So if I execute this cell and uh, put, a, put a new cell here, if I write i of uh, 2, it should give me 2. So it's, it's an identity, okay? So all we will need are lambda expressions in this programming notation. The entire program that you write will be lambda, 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 lambda. That's it. So it's as elementary as Turing machines. And how do we get there? So this is how Church and others have invented modeling lambda calculus uh, and to computability. They define zero. So zero is defined to be lambda b of i. Um, can't explain all the intuitions here, but let us execute that definition and uh, see what zero stands for. Zero is the natural number zero. So natural number zero is a function. Okay, so it has the properties of zero under the right conditions. That's the hope. It takes away one argument, throws it away, and returns you the identity function. So if I apply zero of uh, two, what should I get? It throws two away and returns me i, the identity function. So the answer will be the identity function. Uh, sorry? Oh, okay. All caps, yeah. Zero of two uh, gives me the identity function. So we don't want to use it as such, but uh, let's see what we can. We might have done. Zero of uh, two of thirty-three. At that point, would I have returned? Throws away and returns identity, identity function, which applies to. Okay, so you get uh, some idea of how the encoding is proceeding. What do we do after zero? Well, we need the entire um, natural number scale. So we need to not model one, two, and three, and so on. So the basic thing we add is uh, a the notion of a successor function. So, and then we'll come to modeling addition and things like that. So let us look at add, okay? So finally, we are going to get to add. And what add tries to do is to def apply Add of a b takes the bth successor of a. That's how the addition works. And here's how successor is modeled. Again, a bizarre encoding for you now, but the main property to observe is that it contains nothing but lambda, 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 c, b, a, c, b. Okay, that's it. It's a complex looking function, but uh, it gives you a successor. And then you can model arithmetic and all the addition multiplication operations are all lambda functions that uh, finally invoke successors. And then you can start uh, checking whether these uh, definitions even make sense. So there is an increment function and a church to nat and nat to church function. These are all functions that converts uh, the successor, successor, successor zero to three when it prints on the screen. Uh, and uh, if it takes three, it can convert to the successor form. All that is done. So church to net of zero, uh, church to net of successor of zero is one, church to net of successor of successor of zero is two, and all that. And then you can check whether add works, uh, multiplication works in this notation. Booleans are more hilarious, and uh, so true is modeled as lambda a, lambda b a. It throws away one of the arguments and returns a. False is lambda a, lambda b b. Not is uh, defined, and is defined, or is defined. Um, pair, first, second, and then there are converters from lambda to boolean, boolean to lambda. All this is fun, and you can write expression code, but at some point you need to have looping. And looping is designed, def defined through recursion. So all you need to do is uh, get some familiarity with how recursion is modeled. 
you basically write a recursive factorial uh, in a certain way that abstracts away from the inner function call. The details are not that uh, important for answering the quiz, but if you know that a factorial can be written this way, lambda, if n equal to zero, then one, uh, otherwise n times factorial of n minus one, then there is a way to convert it to the lambda form. So that's all you need to do the quiz. It is a simple module you can run through and uh, answer the one or two simple questions about uh, the quiz uh, based on what you see here. So at least tells you that something called lambda calculus exists and it was invented around the same time as uh, Church, uh, as Turing invented uh, Turing machines. In fact, uh, Turing, Turing was uh, a student of Church's uh, for his PhD. Uh, all that is uh, what I wanted to show. The other thing that I wanted to show is uh, the existence of recursively enumerable languages. Again, a simple uh, illustration. So, since we studied the church hierarchy, the Chomsky hierarchy here, we at least saw that it is possible to have things outside the recursively enumerable language family. So let's kind of see whether that's even likely. Okay, so how does that argument go? So we had to sort of, uh, the simpler way to show that is uh, to first be able to get the sense of how many recursively enumerable languages there exist. Can you sort of uh, enumerate recursively enumerable languages themselves is the trick we are going to use. Okay. And then we will construct a new language that is none of these recursively enumerable languages. It's impossible to be one of them. Hence, we have discovered, at that point, we would have discovered a language that is none of the recursively enumerable ones. That's the trick. And this uh, argument, again, tends to get taught in 2100, but if not, uh, I'll quickly go over it. The idea is that rec all recursively enumerable languages are associated with Turing machines. Each recursively enumerable language is the language of one of the Turing machines or many of the Turing machines, but at least there is one witness Turing machine. And Turing machines are nothing but a code form. Uh, code is uh, a string of zeros and ones. So it's like a natural number. So each code is like a natural number. So that's the idea. You can list all the Turing machines and uh, conceptually. So the final argument is as follows. Suppose uh, there is a recursively enumerable language L1 out there. How shall I understand the language? A language is a collection of strings. Which strings does L1 include? Well, it can be shown by a little bit vector, okay? So suppose uh, L1 